Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Here it is, December 31st, the last day, New Year's Eve. Yes! I'm just sitting here, sipping a Topo Chico in my Las Vegas hotel room, getting ready to do my last stand-up show of the year, which would be, uh, let me see here, I've got the amount of sets I've done this year, I'm going to tell you right now, in 2018, I've done 433 sets so far, I don't like to count any sets that aren't done, but if all goes well, I will be ending the year with, uh, let's see here, 36, 436, if I'm alive by the time I step on stage tonight. <laughs> Superstitious, man, in weird ways like on Drugstore Cowboy. No hats on the bed. Remember that? Absolutely no hats on the bed. God damn it, now we got to move. <laughs> oh, one time early on in my uh, comedy career... I, 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 since I've started comedy, I, I write down every set I do. Every one of them it goes right into my phone and I log them. And there was this time that I, I marked the set before I went on, like about 20 minutes before I went on, I just put down set number 31. And then <laughs> I got bumped and didn't go on that night. So I was like, all right, that's fucking bad luck. Never do that again. Anyway. I'm out here winding it down, about to do one set here in Vegas tonight. The shows have been incredible. I will say this again. The, uh, the uh, Comedy Cellar Las Vegas is one of my new favorite clubs here at uh, the Rio Hotel. It's just been a great week. I'm ready to leave, though. I've done my Vegas time. I've done it. I've huffed the cigarette smoke. I've seen the bad clothing. I've seen the Ed Hardy shirts. I've seen the bedazzled pants. I've seen the uh, tap out shirts. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I've taken in some, uh, some information that will hopefully become material later on, and we, will, and we will see what's happening next, my friends, as Diamond Dave would say. Great guest today. One of the great things, one of the best things about doing stand-up in my uh, nine years of doing it is the new friends I have met over the years. And I just think, wow, man, that's out of everything of doing stand-up, this is probably the coolest thing, is having new friends to hang out that are lunatics like yourself. Like that video on Blind Melon with the bumblebee. I've said that before, but that's what it feels like when I show up at the comedy cellar or the comedy store and I hit the, uh, the patio at the store or the olive tree at uh, the cellar and I walk in and there's the other bumblebees and I'm like, all right, all right, I think I fit in here. <laughs> Joe List is one of those new great friends. I've known him a couple years now. A New York comedian, actually started in Boston. Just a fantastic human and one of the funniest fucking guys I see uh, on stage right now doing it. That's what I love about getting yourself in the mix and being around the best. It's going to drive you to be better. And uh, drop your ego and go, this guy is fucking great. I got to try to at least be as good as this guy. Joe List's been doing comedy 18 years, I believe he told me. Oh, my God. He started when he was 18. He still looks like a fucking kid next to old grandpa here. And, uh, man, is he good. Uh, you, if you have not seen his Netflix, check it out. He's got a 30-minute up. He's got two records on iTunes. One he's proud of, he said. The other one he's not. <laughs> I love the honesty. Great guest, man. We dig into our end of the year 
favorite list. Joe List list. <laughs> we uh, talk all kinds of things. Great music from this year, great films, great concerts, and life doing stand-up comedy. It was a, a, a great episode to end the year with. And I can't thank Joe enough for doing it. And I can't thank all of you enough for tuning in every week right here Monday and supporting Let There Be Talk. Don't forget, what I do want to uh, remind you, though, is let's say right after you listen to this episode, right after you listen to it, or maybe press pause and do it right now so your ADD mind doesn't forget. That's how I am. If I don't take a note right away or do it right then, that shit is out of sight, out of mind. But leave a review on iTunes. I've got so many reviews, 1,325, I believe. But let's see if we can get that thing up to like 1,500. That's how we get the podcast in the top 100. And that's how we get better guests because people see it and they go, this podcast is This thing's doing some shit. Let's get our clients on there. (laughs) So leave a review today as a little thank you to the Let There Be Talk community. Uh, Some upcoming gigs. I will be in L.A. all this week at the Comedy Store and the Laugh Factory. So come see me at those venues. And then March, Joey Diaz and I are going to be hitting... Houston, Texas, March 7, 8, 9 at the Improv. That's going to be fire. You better get your tickets now because I know that will sell out. And then Comedy Castle, I will be headlining in April out there in Detroit. Website, deandelray.com, has all the ticket info. Check out that stuff. Also, if you did order the shirt, the pre-orders are done, and the shirts will be out in about 10 days. Sorry it takes so long, but they're pre-orders, so I get the money, then I get them made, then I send them out. And I can't thank you guys enough for being patient. Those shirts will be going out soon, the Grateful Deans, and you do get some cool stickers with that. Also, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey is uh, all the bonus episodes that let to be talk every Thursday. I've been throwing out some solo episodes. I'm up to 16 episodes now. They're all available there on patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. I want you guys to be safe out there uh, tonight. If you're going out, watch out, man. Don't get fucking killed by Ubers surging. <laughs> Don't get killed by an Uber surge. Get out there. Have some fun. Go see your friends. Ring in the new year 2019. Keep the candles lit. I love all of you. Sip a Topo Chico for me. Here he is, Joe Liss. All right, here we are. Another episode of Let to Be Talk. This is the end of the year episode, and I have a great friend of mine, comedian, Joe List on, so it'll be kind of like Joe's List. I know, I kind of got into a List situation. I, some guy tried to pitch a show with me for List. That was all he kind of had, was like, your last name's List, we'll do Lists. And he like, we shot all this stuff, and he kept rewriting it, and I felt like every network was like, ah, I don't think there's much here. <laughs> it was just like, but he's a List, you see? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I never yeah, really, yeah. Not, I see it, didn't it work out. Each I appreciate week it. you could actually dig into some kind of List, but you would have to really... Um, like after the fifth episode, you'd be like, "All right, we got to find some things." Yeah, exactly. You can't see or listen to enough stuff. Yeah, I'm busy. Yeah, I know, see, right? you listen to so much music. I don't have a car anymore. That's when I used to listen to like the most music was yeah. in my car and shit. But at the house, I end up watching a lot of movies or TV or sports, and so I don't have as much time to listen to as much music. I got to get more in there. Well, I replaced sports with music right. when I was about in the seventh grade. <laughs> That's not bad. Yeah, see? So what do you do? You just listen around the house and Yeah, and house and, and shit? then um, definitely all flights yeah. and uh, walking around the city here. Yeah, um, I try not to listen too much while I'm in the city walking because I like to hear over here people's conversations. Totally. I, I heard two women walking. Uh, this is a true story. Last week I was walking out 14th. I heard one woman right behind me say to the other woman, when we get to your house, I got to take a shit. Wow. I couldn't believe this. And then the other, <laughs> other woman goes, 
it better not stink. She was actually mad. Oh, that's mean. Yeah, and then the other woman goes, I can't control that. <laughs> and they started fighting. And Wait, I how t- old are these women? They were like in their 30s. And then I told Joe Mackey that, and he goes, ew, you got to peek behind the curtain, dog. <laughs> <laughs> hey, gang. I couldn't believe it, though. It was so, so I like hearing that kind of shit. I do hear a lot of stuff. Yeah, you can hear some really fun stuff. Sometimes it's just a snippet because you're just walking by. Yeah. And then you can just hear, yeah, my pussy's been smelling worse. As you're like walking by and you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> like that's some real that. shit, man. Yeah, yeah. That's so crazy. Well, that's the thing with New York living. Sarah and I always talk about this. Like even at home... I mean, you're, you have thick walls here and you're up on the top floor, but like sometimes like I can hear our neighbor when they're cooking. Like oh. I can hear the fucking stove. So I'm like, they're hearing everything we're saying. Like our life is just a live podcast for our neighbors. Yeah. That's what's brutal about New York. Someone can always hear you pretty much. Same with LA. That's why uh, this place I'm staying at right now is like, it's almost, I realized I had PTSD from the last six months in LA of the apartment, I could hear the people perfectly. It was blowing my mind. Yeah, it's a bummer. And like, you know, you're having sex or whatever, or like you're just having a cut, like your deepest shit. Someone can overhear it. And these days, like someone hears an opinion they don't like, they'll hate you. Oh yeah, right. Like I hate that guy. He said he liked your Trump voter next door. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) But they're like, oh, that guy said he didn't like, you know, the Godfather. I hope he dies. (laughs) Yeah, I'm projecting. I would feel that way if someone didn't like the Godfather. Yeah, but there are people that don't like the Godfather, and I'm, I, I just go, oh, cool. We don't need to talk at all. Yeah, those people don't make sense. Someone made an argument. There was some movie where, or some podcast, I guess. I didn't listen to it, but someone was telling me where they made an argument about how it could be overrated and how the book has so much more and the problem with the movie is like there's a lot of information you're supposed to just know about the families and certain like you there's a lot that's not presented well if you just watched it for the first time you're kind of like wait who is this and what is the five family if you don't know a lot about mob life and i was like i guess that's an interesting point or a good point and the second movie can be a little confusing because it's like who are the risotto brothers and right. you know it's flashbacks so and yeah all that. there's a lot of stuff but that's the best case i've ever heard for it not being perfect but i still think yeah it's perfect. yeah i mean i i did read recently yeah that there was ex- a bunch of extra scenes shot yeah uh, where they explain a lot of that stuff. right right yeah i went on a long youtube kick where like they they're all on youtube all these scenes were like they go and like after the wedding they all go and visit uh, Don Tomasino as he's like dying and stuff and they're like talking to him they kind of like give a lot more background and stuff of yeah. like so there's definitely like a lot of stuff that could be in it because the books are much longer yeah they should, haven't read they should re- you know you have, uh, I went to the theater and watched it in chronological order yeah that was incredible where they took two and one and they put them all together right right so what they should do is release a DVD or you know the saga and with all those extra scenes like Apocalypse Now they right. did the Redux yeah yeah that. yes that I mean I love that shit. I, I can't get enough of it. Like, I should read the book, I was realizing, because I'm like, I love the movies. So I've, I've watched them a hundred times. Yeah. The first two, the third one, I don't care for at all. But um, I'm like, I should just read the book and like get more into that world. But Coppola is unbelievable. I mean, you, you've watched the documentary, The uh, oh, Heart yeah, of Hearts Darkness. Of Darkness? Yeah. I mean, that movie is like unbelievable. Well, he's my idol. He's hey. my idol, you know, because he's the epitome of art. He'll burn everything to the ground Insane. for his art. Yeah. And I love his wife. Like in that uh, movie, she's just like, I just feel an artist has to have the freedom. So what? Like he's got their house up for sale. Unbelievable. And they're sitting in the jungle and she's like, you know, I support him. I love him. You're like, God, that's amazing. It's so crazy to think about these masterpieces that he made and at the age he made and the trust that the theater had in right. him. Incredible. That's crazy because, like, he's like, oh, yeah, I want to have, uh, you know, Al Pacino for this role. And they're like, no way, that guy sucks. Yeah, yeah. And not until he shot the guy in the restaurant when they shot that scene that yeah. the studio go, oh, oh, we're on board. Yeah, yeah. No, it's amazing. They said they wanted, like, Robert Redford. And then yeah. he was like, well, he's got red hair. And they're like, well, some Italians have red hair. And he's like, that's true, but I don't want him to look like a guy with red hair. I was like, this is all really amazing stuff. I mean, there's so much in there. And, like, seeing all, like, the script with all his notes on the side oh. and the book. Like, that guy's like a true artist. I love that man. You know, all his films. Uh, I mean, Outsiders. Yeah, dude. yeah. 
straight masterpiece. Godfather 2 masterpiece, you know? The conversation is amazing. Oh. Apocalypse, that Hearts of Darkness, when he's on the helicopter yelling at the guy while it's taking off, he has to like jump off the helicopter. You're like, holy shit. I love that when they're like, uh, hey, where are the planes going? Oh, they got to go fight a war. He's like, fuck their war. We're shooting a movie. (laughs) It's insane. They're literally fighting like a civil war. And he's like, God damn it. No, it's amazing. And that whole scene, like you can relate to it with comedy where he's like, I'm making a bad movie. He's like, no one believes me. This movie's going to suck. Of course, it's like one of the great movies of all time. Of all time. All that stuff is amazing with the Brando and he's like paying him a million bucks a week. And it's just incredible. Like Heart of Darkness or Hearts of Darkness. Hearts of Darkness, yeah. That is one of the best movies ever made. Yeah, I had Jerry Ferrara on uh, Turtle from... um, from the entourage okay i never watched the show. and he uh he and i we worship that documentary so yeah. we we went crazy over it you know how long have you been doing comedy uh 18 years now i started when i was 18 18 years so i've been doing comedy half my life now fuck you're so good dude oh thanks like man. one of my favorites it's it funny i was at uh sirius xm doing uh some one show over there and then they wanted me to do this side show where like just a blurb who do you think uh, the next great coming upcoming comic is so i said you and they go oh well you can't use him he's uh, like a special and everything i go that doesn't mean shit oh i appreciate it yeah you know i'm saying I yeah, go, yeah you know everyone has specials and right right until people know the person they're still up and coming yeah that's how i feel also it's weird it's a weird thing because like sometimes people are like up and coming but you're like hey i've been around but then you're like but also nobody i sell fucking 50 tickets in a city so it's yeah. like this weird thing this weird in between where you feel like you're like it, it can be depressing comedy a little bit where you're like yeah, a little like bit resume is like insane <laughs> but you're like nah you're just not selling any tickets you're like what the fuck do i have to do i you know i i've, I've since this is an end of the year list i've also come to the conclusion i'm, I'm in the same way i feel like i got a zillion listeners on here but none of them come to the shows so i'm like all right for now on, it's going to be all comedy content in 2019. You had my music. I mean, not the podcast, but like Instagram and right, Twitter right. and everything. You had my music stuff. I need to like, hey, I'm a comedian. Right, you right. Because it's like people are just like, your, your, your show's great. It's like, yeah, well, come out and see me do comedy. Well, I was just talking about this recently because I have a podcast with Mark Norman. And th- sometimes you're like, there are people I think that are podcast fans that aren't necessarily stand-up comedy fans. 100%. Like, I think there's people that listen to my podcast that are like, I don't have any interest to go to the fucking Funny Bone. Yeah. They're like, this is just a radio show with two idiots cracking wise or whatever. They're like, I don't want to buy a ticket and go get parking. It's Fuck so your weird. stand-up. Like, yeah. I'm just listening to a radio show. To me, if I'm a fan of somebody, I want to go be a fan of all their stuff. And I'm really interested in seeing what they do live. Yeah, totally. I mean... Comedy is such a thing that needs to be live yeah. to me. That's why I don't enjoy most comedy specials because I just know how much better it was live. I say that all the time. It's just even like, you know, bring the pain or something that great. You're yeah. like, but imagine this in the room. Oh, I uh, here's here's when it hit me over the head last week. A guy DMs me. He goes, I just listened to your Nels Klein episode. Oh, my God. I got to get to New York and see that guy play. And I said, why don't you get to New York and see me do some stand-up? Right, right. That's what I wrote. I mean, while you're seeing him go play, come stop by and say, not one mention of that, you know? And then right. he goes, and then he goes ha, 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 yeah, maybe that too. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> you know? Dude, it's hard. It's like, it's, it's so hard. And like you put like, I had like a Netflix half hour, but what happens now, I think people, they'll watch a thing and even if they think it's great, they go, oh, that was great. All right, I'm going to go watch Making a Murderer or yeah. whatever. Like they don't go... Let me write this down. Like, because you and I, we're like, we're artists. We support the arts. Like, that's, I hear, like, hear a song. I'm like, let me write this down. Let me check their date. As soon as I hear about a band, like, you'll post about a band, I'll go listen to a few tracks and then I immediately go to the tour to see if I can go see them live. Yeah. Like, that's like, I want to go see these bands or, or musicians or singer, song, or comedians, whatever it is, or the movies, or I'll see a movie that I like. I'm like, let me find out every other movie he's made so I can go watch it. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of people, not that we're like, we're better than them. But like yeah. a lot of people just don't consume just art that way. It's just shit to them. Yeah. I just did that because I, uh, I was practicing what it would be like for me to do an audio book. So I just did the kind of the intro to the book. Right. And I posted it up on my Patreon. And I realized what I said on there was my entire life is, is built around passion. Mm-hmm. 
And I, I used Apocalypse Now as an example. And I said, this is how my life has been over and over and over. This is the process. I see something. Apocalypse Now. Love it. Immediately go home. Who was the director? I want to know more about the Vietnam War. I right. want to know more about the music that was in it. I want to know more about the time period, the frame, and the actors. Now I have so many olive branches. Yeah, exactly. That I'm in a million rabbit holes till I've consumed everything Apocalypse Now. I feel the same way. Like Lawrence Fishburne, I think, was like 14 years old in that movie. Oh, yeah. It's so, so crazy. He's supposed to be there like three weeks. Yeah, yeah. It was insane. But yeah, I, I have the same exact thing. I got into like, I watched this new surf documentary on HBO about Kelly Slater and all those guys. Oh, oh those seen guys it. were great. It's so great. But like the same thing. I'm like, I'm Googling every fucking surfer and like reading all their bios. I'm on Wikipedia, this whole thing. And like, I've never surfed in my life or anything. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm so fascinated by it. So. It's the same thing. Like you, you're just like, what else did this person make? What else did they done? Let me, I'm gonna read every interview and yeah, it's I'm, fun. Uh, it really is, and it, and it's it's like your brain. I think that's why we can't really remember anything because we consume so much. No, totally. And I'll like set reminders to listen to an album. Like you'll recommend a band. My buddy Matt Wayne, who's a great comedian, he. He's really into music and like he has all this stuff set up for like new music Monday. He like uses Apple Music really well. Oh, yeah. And he'll send me like too many bands. I'm like, just send me one at a time. I yeah. can't take on five bands at once because it's yeah. like too much. So what I do is I, I add them into the this is why I use iTunes, uh, Apple Music. I love it. I just hit add and then it's in my for you. And then I get on a plane and I go, oh, yeah, this band. I haven't even checked this out. So, boom, I'll start playing it. Right. And then I'll be like, oh, this ain't bad or, oh, this is terrible. And then I'll, I'll dump it out. If it's great, it stays in. Right. Now, because you're such like a, you're so passionate and you're so into everything it feels like. I feel like I very rarely hear you be like, this sucks. Well, Is there music that you're like, this fucking blows? You know, a few years ago, Somebody said something to me, and it. I was ripping on Justin Bieber for a year. Yeah. He came to one of my shows. He was a cool guy. He right, loved right. a bit and everything. And yeah. I was like, oh, wow. You know? I guess. So somebody said something to me, and it hit me so fucking hard, and it changed my, my whole outlook on life from that day on. Promote what's great, not what you hate. Yeah, I feel the same. Doug Stanhope used to do a bit about that years ago, about how people would always go like... Uh, Hey, Doug, we love you. Dane Cook sucks. He's like, first of all, he's like, I'd rather hang out with Dane than any one of my fans. He's like, do you understand how much more in common I have with Dane than any of you guys? But then he's like, don't tell me who sucks. Say who's great. Be like, Doug, we love you. You should check out this guy. Yep. He's like, I don't want to know who sucks. But yeah, it's, it feels that way. And also like that happens where you're like, we might have to bump. We're in the business. You might have to bump into these people you're trashing. Yeah. Also... There's other people that like different stuff that still might like you, too. Right, so right. So somebody might be a Bieber fan and be a Delray fan. Right. And if you go like this fucking guy, then they go, man, I don't understand. I really enjoy that. And right. then I realized, like, I go, okay, you know, there's tons of stuff I don't like, but it's just throwing negative energy out there. Right, right. And I'd rather just throw out, there's so much great stuff in the world. Yeah. If I just spread that word... It'll be way better, and those people will maybe be uh, discovered by Bieber fans. Right, right. It, it's just a weird game, you know? No, it's a good point, and yeah, I've been trying to do the same thing. It's like, fucking check out these people. Yeah. This I, stuff I is used good. to be that guy, though, where it was like pretty easy, but I will shit on like p other things, like you know, people walking in New York and texting, that oh, kind of shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's where my anger goes now, stuff like that. No, totally. I completely agree. But yeah, I, for me, like my, my cousin was just telling me, he's like, I got to send you some bands. But he's like, I'm so nervous because you're so particular. And I'm like, oh, geez. And he's like, I, I'm just nervous. I don't want to tell you. And so now I like feel bad that I'm like putting out this vibe of this like music cunt. <laughs> I'm like, all yeah. right. But to me, for me with music, at least, I'm like, it's got to be, I don't know how you feel. I'm like, it's got to be instruments. I need like raw material, anything electronic. I, right? I can't that, do. Yeah. I need like. If you get a Other few people craft work. with like, you know, some drums and a couple of guitar, whatever it is, I'm like, I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah. You know, I hate, you know, Creed or whatever, but like, you know, yeah. as long as there's people playing and writing some shit, I'm, like, I'm, I'm listening to it. What I can't stand is when you post up a band that's, say, in a, what I would call a, a uh, kind of a sabbath -y vibe or a Caius desert rock vibe. Yeah. And then 
people hit you with 40 of them that sound exactly the same. Right, right. If you like them, you're going to love this, 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 and this. And after a while, you go like, well, now you're missing the whole point. I'm not into the style. I'm into this band and the songs. Right, it's right. It's got to have songs for us. You can't just be the flavor of the band. I yeah. mean, that was the problem with the grunge era. Everybody all of a sudden was like, rrr, rrr, rrr. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. like, no, dude, you, you sound like Pearl Jam, but you don't have the songs. Right, right. Yeah, you're not them. Yeah. Now, now where do you fall on the uh oh fuck what's their name greta greta van sestrin the uh <laughs> the led zeppelin band well i had him on when when i first uh heard the ep i i think it, the ep is some of the best songs i've heard in years yeah um and as far as the record goes it doesn't come close to me of the ep interesting okay. as the songwriting was so unbelievable yeah of the uh, of the EP. And also, I think that their record company has made a crucial mistake yeah. of just pouncing the Zeppelin comparison. Right, right. And that is going to turn a lot of people off uh, because you cannot compare one of the greatest bands of all time right. to a band with one record. Right. You just cannot do that. It's funny, I was on the Rolling Stones Instagram, and they'll post about stuff, and yeah. they posted about them, and it was like a side-by-side -side of Robert Plant, and I don't know the name of the lead singer of the right. band, but it was like every single comment, I read like 500 comments, yeah. and it almost went like in a pattern of every other, someone was like, fuck these guys, Love they're them. rip off, they're like, yeah. the, the Zeppelin. and then the next thing one was like this, who cares if they sound like them, at least they sound great, they yeah. rock, and it was literally like every other comment, it was like completely divided of like, yeah, they sound like Led Zeppelin, but they fucking kick ass. At least we have a band that's kicking ass. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting to read. Well, both you know, sides. Mitzi Shore from the store always said that you need half America to hate you and half them to love you to be uh, a big comic. Right, right. Because then you're always in the conversation at the at the you know at the uh, what what do they call that the water. The water cooler? Water cooler. Yeah, you yeah. know, one guy going like, I can't stand that Dean Del Rey. The other guy's, you're crazy. That guy's great. And when you got that, you've made it. Yeah, that was in that Howard Stern, Stern movie with like the Paul Giamatti characters like, well, they're listening. The people that love you listen for three hours a day. And he's like, what about the people that hate us? They're like, they listen for four hours a day. No. Like those people, or whatever that line was, I'm butchering That's it, great. I'm sure. But. I mean, that, that band is, um, it's it's the typical record company um, thing. I can't stand when people say, uh, hey, Greta Van Fleet's bringing rock back. And I tweeted this. I said, that's just rude to the 200 bands that have been playing rock for 10, 15 years that yes. don't have the uh, record company muscle. Yeah, well, that's a, Sarah and I have had this, my wife, have had this kind of like, not argument, but discussion. She's like, nobody rocks anymore. And I was like, no, no, you're just not seeking it out. And that's it's not it. popular music anymore. That's all it is. In 1987 or 1992, the popular music was Guns N' Roses and then Alice in Chains. That's what you heard on the radio. But like, just because it's not the popular music right now doesn't mean people aren't fucking ripping it. There's so like much bands, out there. Yeah, there's like plenty of bands that rock. I said this year was probably one of the best years of music I ever remember in 10 years. Yeah. I can't even... I couldn't even do the top 10. I was trying to put my top 10 together and I left a couple out and people were like offended almost. They were like, wait, wait, I thought you loved this band and they were on your... I go, I do love them, but man, it's like, yeah. where do I put them in the 10? Yeah, someone gets left out. Yeah, there's... I'm, I'm proud that there's 20 that I think are insane. Right. You know how great that is? Yeah, 20 is... I mean, films, I feel like you don't get 20 in a, uh, no, in a not year. Not even close. Not at all. But yeah, we, you just got to go and, and see these bands. I took Sarah to see Dr. Dog. You know Dr. Dog? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're like a great, but they played in Brooklyn. And I was like, come see this band. I'm like, I know you don't know anything about them, but like they rock and they're fucking great. They're tight. And she was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, we just got to seek it out. We can do that if you want to go do that. You, you can know? do that, man. And, and that those bands, you can see them for 20 bucks or 30 bucks. That's what I keep saying, too. Stop seeing these bands with one original member and, and they're <laughs> right, arguing right. out there and shit. And the ticket's $200. 
Go see. I saw so many bands this year already at Irving Plaza. Yeah. You know, Marcus King could be the best live show I've seen in 15, 20 years. Yeah, you were saying. I, I kind of got into yeah. that. And it was like $20 at Irving Plaza, yeah. and it was completely sold out. And everyone in there knew. Like, when you see a room that sold out and where it's oversold, yeah. you go, oh, this band's they're getting ready to break. Yeah, that's a fun feeling, man. So where'd you start comedy at? I started in Boston. In, oh, you're from uh, Boston? 2000, yeah, yeah. I grew up at South Shore, Whitman, Massachusetts, which is like 35, 40 minutes south of Boston. And uh, yeah, I started in this place called Chops Lounge, which isn't there anymore. It's right next to Fenway Park. It was like this, just this dumpy Howard Johnson's hotel, and it was like the truest open mic I ever did. Like, people, like homeless people would walk up and be like, I'll go up there. Yeah. And you had like crazy people. There'd be like a few comics... A bunch of crazy people and like weird alcoholics and that's how I start. It's now like this hipster hotel, which is hilarious. It's like the nicest, hippest hotel. Yeah. But um, that's where I started. And then uh, I'm a big Pearl Jam guy and I saw them at Fenway this year. And they were talking about the first time they ever played, they played, I think it was the Axis nightclub and they stayed in that hotel, which is kind of interesting. Pearl Jam stayed in the same place where my uh, comedy career began, which was exciting. What got you into connection. comedy? Eddie Murphy or something? Or uh, Chris Rock? To me, it was Carlin. I mean, I, it was like, Carlin. I was really young. My uncle had HBO and he was like really into, um, I mean, first of all, I was like, I grew up, I was born in 82, so it was like late 80s, early 90s. It was, it was just on, VH1 and A&E and oh, yeah, that MTV. Was a, yeah. So it was always on. Like my uncle was a few years older than me, which sounds weird. You think of like an uncle being 20 years older than you. My family's fucked up. He was four or five years older than me, but he showed me all this stuff. And then like George Carlin, like jamming in New York and then doing it again, those specials. I just thought I didn't get half the jokes, but it was so fucking cool and weird. And everyone was like, this guy's great. So I was like, okay, this guy's great. And uh, I remember like memorizing rat shit, fat shit, dirty old twat, 69 assholes uh, tied in a knot. I remember like literally doing that in like fourth grade. And like the kids were like, this guy's crazy. Like I was just doing Carlin bits in like yeah, fourth yeah. grade. Yeah. So I was really into that. And then like Cosby, I got really into and like Elaine Boozler and like even Gallagher I loved as oh, a yeah. kid. And like so I had like all those kind of big, you know, eighties, nineties. Ellen I loved. And then like I listened to um and like I was like sixteen when I'm telling you for the last time. I, I was obsessed with Seinfeld, the T V oh, yeah. show. Absolutely. Same obsessed here. with it. Like I was like, that's what I want my life to be. I want to be a comic with funny friends, you know. And then I'm telling you for the last time, blew my mind, because I had only ever seen him do stand-up on the show, which yeah. isn't great. It's kind of like manufactured and kind of whatever. But then I watched the special, and I was like, this guy's amazing. I went to the shoot of that. Like, oh, really? Well, at the end, when he walks out at the Paramount, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there. Oh, wow. So I was like, oh, this is a weird shoot. It's just a one camera behind the curtain. And they were only shooting him coming out, you know, because that's when he was going to run the bits. Right, that. right. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I worshipped him, too. I would go everywhere to see him. I had a girlfriend at the time. That was our thing. Seinfeld, Lake Tahoe. Seinfeld, Reno. Oh, that's Seinfeld, awesome. Seinfeld, Circle Star Theater. And we'd go everywhere to see him. He's, uh, he's. I mean, he was amazing. I just got to bring him up on stage for the first time in my life the other day. At Bill Burr's show, actually. Oh, yeah. I was opening, and then uh, Seinfeld showed up and like did a guest spot. So that was really oh, cool. Oh, up there at the West Side. It was at, no, this is at Gotham. Oh, at Gotham? Yeah, oh, oh, the a couple Gotham weeks ago. show. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, so I was like way into him and then I started doing comedy and then like when you start doing comedy, you start, uh, getting introduced to all these comedians you didn't know of before, like Patrice O'Neill and Doug Stanhope and Louis CK. Cause at that time, like 2000, 2001, 2002, Bill Hicks, those guys weren't that big. Yeah. Bill Hicks, I found out about shortly after too. And then you're like, wow, like these guys are insane. Yeah. And then in Boston, there's all these like Boston guys that never really left, like, uh, Mike Donovan, Tony V, and Don Gavin. So you start to be like, oh, fuck Elaine. But like Elaine Booz is great, and George Carlin's yeah, yeah. great. But like, not I don't mean to say fuck them, but you're like, these guys are like incredible because they're like doing spots every night, and like you're like, there's all these people that aren't famous that are amazing, and you're like, I want to be like those guys. And then I discovered like Gary Gullman. Oh god, he would pop in because he's How from great Boston. Is that guy, he's like the best to me. I think he's like top three or four. I like, can't ever. Believe- I mean, he's one of the first guys I saw when I realized I wanted to kind of do comedy. Uh, he was doing the Laugh Factory quite a bit in L.A. with Jay Davis. They were off that tour gas. Yeah, yeah. And, and Bobby Kelly. And, and I saw him, and he had that bit. He had two bits. He had one about uh, 
uh, I'll take a Coke. And they go, sorry, sorry, no Coke. Yeah, Pepsi. yeah. And he's all, even the waiter, sorry. You know, I'm not going to do the bit because I'll fuck it up. But, yeah. you know, the other cola. Yeah, yeah. The billboard. Um, and then the one about the fruit salad. Yeah. Both clean bits. And I was like, I still don't know how to write clean at all. It's hard, dude. I, I think we might have talked about this. Last year, or after I did my Netflix thing, I was like, you know what? I'm going to do a clean hour because I'm like the corporate gigs. Like, I just want to make money. And I was like, let me just write a clean hour. I'll get it on Sirius Radio. And you make more money. And then the first like 12 minutes I wrote were about shit and dick. I was just like, it was just <laughs> sex stuff and shit stuff. I was like, all right, next hour. Yeah. I'm writing clean the next hour. Yeah. But those guys, I mean, like, Gullman was like amazing. The first bit I saw him do, this is like almost 20 years ago now, it was about. How he watched a documentary where prisoners with boyfriends would wear their pants really low. Uh-huh. And he's like, I feel like I would do that even if I didn't have a boyfriend. And then they'd be like, where's your boyfriend? You don't have a boyfriend. He's like, he goes to a different prison. <laughs> he goes to Shawshank. And it was like this whole thing that seems so silly, but like exactly my sense of humor. And like he like blew me away and still does. So he, I, I, I mean, I always want to talk to him more and more, but I, I, I always know when I'm one of those people, he's kind of like, who is Dean? You know right, I mean? right, like, right. I'm either too much for someone or they get it, you know? Right. But I'm always excited around him because I'm like, man, how does, he's like a magician to me. Like, how do you do that right clean? You he's know? a brilliant guy, and like, he has these long bits, and they're so thoughtful. One time, I opened for him for a while, and we're, you know, we're good buddies, and we were watching, we were on the road, I think in Philly, and I was like, there's a big college football game. I was like, let's go watch the game. And he's like, all right, come to my room. And it's like a four-hour game. I was watching the game the entire time. He was writing. He had like two notebooks. And he was like listening to the night before his set. And he just transcribes it and like changes words. And like every once in a while, he'd like pull an earbud out and be like, that was a crazy play. <laughs> and like, I was like, this guy can't even watch a football game. Like he's working all day. Yeah. And it's like one of those things. Sometimes there's artists that you are like, I want to be like that guy. And then you see their process and you're like, oh, he's, on a, he's doing a different thing. Yeah. How do you write? On stage? I try to write a little bit on stage. I'll sit with a notebook a little bit, but there's a lot of like just like jotting down a note. Yeah. And I'll just try to like kind of get involved in the feel. Because like, Burr was actually talking about this to Seinfeld, if I may name drop. I was over hearing. And Louis has said similar things where, like, if you write too much, and this is what Burr says, like, I'll be on stage visualizing a piece of paper, being like, what did I write again? Oh, Instead yeah. of, like, what do you feel about this yeah. thing? So it's like, I like to write to get those thoughts out and have it down. But it's also like, you don't want to be removed and disconnected from the feeling or emotion that you're yeah. trying to talk about. But that's definitely a thing I've done where I'm like, oh, what was the word I wrote down? But you're like, well, just say what the fuck you're thinking. Yep. So it's definitely got to be like a balance. And it's interesting about comedy that you're like, can still be figuring it out after all this time. Yeah, I know. I just write like bullet points, you know, the bullet words, and then go up there and try to roll it, you know. And then if it works, I uh, listen back and make notes like that worked. I definitely think listening to your set is like the most important thing. Because oh, then I'm like, yeah. oh, I should be saying that. Or oh, you're like, yeah. this could be like this. Because I always think when you're watching comedy, oh. you're always like, oh, he should say that. Or you're like, I thought he was going to say this. Yeah. So it's like you have to do that for yourself, to yourself. Yeah. I remember opening for Louie, and uh, I was backstage, and there was another comic back there. And I, I said, yeah, I got to listen to this set real quick from last night. I said something funny in there. And then the other comic goes, I record all my sets, but I, I never listen to them. And then Louie looked at him in disgust and said, that's your job. Right, right. He was just like, what? Why would you record them and not listen? That's all you're supposed to do. Yeah, you got to do it. And like, cause it, so often you just don't realize you listen. You're like, oh, I'm saying the completely wrong totally word wrong. or like I'm saying this backwards or like this isn't even clear. So it's definitely, I think, the most important thing. And then also Gullman said this to me before, too. The hardest part of writing is like starting writing. Right. So the great thing about listening to a set, as soon as you hit play, you're writing. Once yeah. you're listening to yourself, you're like, your brain is now working that thing. So it's like one of those things that it's hard to just be like, okay, I'm going to put my pen to the paper. Here I go. But like if you hit play, you're like, okay, now I'm, I'm yeah. working. 2019, I'm going to start taping one set a week too, videoing it. Yeah. Uh, an hour to watch because I think a big mistake a lot of people make is they never look at their self till they get a special. Right, right. And then they exactly. go, oh my God, look at, 
You, I That's mean, hilarious. you're about to do the biggest thing in your life, and you've never even done it before. That's a good Film point. the set. That is a good point. So what made me think of that was last week, I found an old set from 2016 on my, on my computer, and I go, oh, wow, this is cool. I, I just found this. I'm going to watch it. And I watched it, a 35-minute set, and I was like, oh, man, I was so animated back there, like too much. You know, right, I was kind of right. like, yeah. <laughs> making faces and moving and right and i was all crunched over and, right you know and i was like oh man i gotta start watching myself like once a month yeah yeah that's a good point i don't i'm like i don't know when i ever watch myself i guess just a, a late night i'll like pull yeah. up a video and you gotta put a clip together or whatever the hell i think it's good to do because you can it gives you like uh mental notes of like of confidence also on stage of like I uh, move I'm not I'm not turning away when the punchline's coming out right you know, Ralphie May used to have this thing where you go you know set up set up punch so left right middle for the for the uh, punchline right right so the whole room's wrapped in yeah I try to do that it's definitely kind of like work yeah the room. Be like oh I haven't looked over here in a while like to make sure you're giving it because otherwise people will just That's leave they'll just go I'm gonna out. go yeah exactly you definitely have to have to address everybody for yeah. sure. It's funny, like you're 18 years in. How much has your style changed from when you started? Are you a completely different comic now? Boy, I don't know. I mean, like I haven't listened to any of that old stuff. It doesn't feel because you don't. You're you, so you're always doing it. So it doesn't feel like a dramatic right change. But like, I mean, material wise, of course, it's changed. Like for the first few years, I was just doing jokes about how I can't get laid, and then like then I slowly went into like getting laid now it's yeah. like about being married and stuff so there's yeah. definitely that but but i mean were you were you super good out of the gate or were you just like really bad and then eventually got good i always was like considered like looking back now i'm like oh that sucked but at the time i was always pretty good but people were like oh man he's good he's like a good young guy and like i started working pretty early like i opened for dane cook in like oh four so i was like four years in and like that was when he hadn't blown up yet, but it was like sold out Comedy Connection Boston. So I got some like decent gigs and like I was like good enough. I was pretty good. Um, but like I said, if I watched it now, you'd be like, oh, this guy kind of sucks. But it was like, I think I was one of those guys where people were always like, oh, he's pretty good. He's got something. Like he doesn't suck. Yeah. He's new, but doesn't suck. So I always felt like I was doing pretty good. Yeah. I definitely feel better now than I did, you know, 10 years ago. I but, felt like I was pretty good at, at, out of the gate, and then you start to put like uh, like uh, expectations on yourself because you're course. comedy. You're around. It's the only thing where if you're doing it in New York or L.A., you're around the greatest. Yeah, while you're doing it. Yeah, yeah, like with totally. Music, you're not opening for ACDC and then, <laughs> right, and then right. Pearl Jam the next week and right, Wilco right. or something. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. It's also a weird thing because like, and Seinfeld's talked about this. It's the only thing where you're just introduced as the thing the first time yeah like you're like this is a comedian like you're like i'm not a comedian i'm just yeah. a guy walking on stage right now but like the audience perceives you as like you're a comedian and i think his analogy was like you would never just like someone that wants to get into like surgery you wouldn't just give him a knife and be like okay you're yeah. a surgeon get yeah. in there here's a doctor <laughs> yeah yeah you're like fuck <laughs> so uh it definitely yeah it takes time but i feel like style wise it's always been pretty much the same just really kind of standing there yeah but when i first started i was 18 i was i loved jim carrey and i wanted to be like kind of a high energy i was so into jim carrey at the time but like you, you realize faces and shit i never did because i would try it a couple times but like the thing is, if you're bombing high energy, it sucks. It sucks. Like if you're just like, "What's up?" Ah! and the crowd is laughing, so I'm like, right? I'd rather be able to bomb just standing here and be like, "All right, at least I'm just a guy." I never thought here. about that because you got to keep giving the energy, yeah. but they're not giving you any. I always thought that I'm like, if Jim Carrey or Dane Cook or someone's bouncing around, you're eating it. It's people are just like, "What's up with this fucking guy?" You yeah. know. So I'm like, I always just kind of went lowish energy, um, and then I and my personality became that. Anyway, as you get older, you're more like. Yeah, hey, what's jaded. Up? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got a lot of webs on your heart. Yeah, I'm not like, hey, what's up, everybody? But it, it definitely felt harder to eat it high energy. So that's funny, man, to think about that. I never even thought about that, you know. Um, I mean, also, Jim Carrey to me is a lot like Kaufman. When people come on, I go, ah, he's doing the Kaufman thing, you know, yeah. like they've, they've, they nailed it such 
it's such their thing that if anybody else does it, you're like, yeah, this guy's trying to be like Jim Carrey. And that was like yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think D- Dane had that for a while. There was like a lot of people doing Dane back yeah. in like oh, the yeah. mid 2000s. There was a lot of guys doing Tosh when I came out. They had the cardigan. Right, They right. had their arm crossed and they would try to be super edgy, but they didn't even know how to write edgy jokes. Right, right. You know, so they'd be like, oh, really? You, too soon you know they like they were all tosh when uh, i came out i hate that shit and then it became that. burr you know the arm on the mic stand yes we're yeah. all burr you know it's a it's a trip when you see uh people become the people you know at open mics and stuff i still go to open mics you know so I, yeah i see it happening you know well sometimes you'll see like you can tell like uh, that person will grow out of that yeah, like yeah. there's some people that you're like that person's doing an impression and they're not funny yeah. But sometimes you'll see someone with like a killer bit that looks like they're doing burr, but you're like, once he gets rid of that thing, he's got the he's got the goods. Yeah. Because most comics, I feel like if you pulled up an old video, you're like, oh, he's doing a thing. Like I had, oh, I did Gullman for a while when I was like really young. I had like two hands on the mic and would like do like finger gun and like yeah, all this finger stuff. Finger gun. And I was like, oh man, I'm just doing a Gullman thing for yeah. sure. But you develop out of it, and it's fun as you get older. You do that more of that like who you are off stage becomes very much who you are on stage. And that's, well, that's what feeling. you want. Yeah. You know, and you don't realize that till one day when somebody goes, Oh, you're the same guy on stage is off. Right. Know? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you might tune it up a little bit. Of course. Yeah. You you're know? performing, course, but you're still yeah. like the same thing. Yeah. I, uh, it's funny because, uh, you, okay. You have a special out on Netflix. I wanted to promote that because I think that it, it whizzed by, you had a 30 minute, Congrats on that. Thanks. Yeah, the season 2 of the stand-ups. And were you the first one out of the gate? I was on for season 2. Yeah, I was Thank first episode. Thank God. You know, there's so many weird cards to play. Oh, you finally get a special, but you're third in uh, in this uh like run and all that stuff. Yeah, totally. We fought for cuz Nate Bargatze, he's a good friend of mine. He went he was season 1 episode 1. So he's like you got to fight for that first episode. So we did, but even then, it's like there's still like it's so oversaturated. It feels like there's so many specials, and it's season two of a thing. So I got a little bump, but not as much as I would like. So please go check it out. Yeah, yeah, please check that out. You got a record out? Yeah, all right. It's called I have two. One's called uh, So Far No Good, which is not the best. It's from 2010. I'm an idiot. I recorded my first album. Was my first ever headlining weekend at a club. Oh my god! So, like what I are just like, yeah. I just was like, I had been featuring for years and doing comedy for it, but I was a drunk at the time too. So there's some like really good jokes on there, but you can tell I'm like drunk and like filling time. I'm oh, like, shit. what'd you say? Something happened over there? Like it's like, oh, you'd get drunk before you went on? Oh yeah, I was like shit housed on stage. Really? So, it's kind of like it's cringy for me, but there are some decent bits on there. But then I did another one two years ago called "Are You Mad at Me?" and that one I'm like really proud of. So that's out there. What got you to out. quit drinking? You just wanted to be more pro. Yeah, you know it's funny. You were in a Bill Hicks shirt. That movie really was like I didn't realize. I watched it like three days before I got sober. The um, documentary. Yeah. Oh, I love it. But I knew. I mean, I knew I was going to have to quit. I was a fucking maniac. I mean, I got herpes i shit in a girl's shoe i was a blackout drunk really and I, uh, yeah i was like a vandal i would vandalize shit all the time i was just a mess and i hated Ooh. myself you and mark norman together must have been a ne- like madness well you know it's funny mark and i didn't become that close until like after well we drank for, there was like a year we drank together but we came much closer after i quit because i had just kind of met him yeah and uh, i was kind of running in like a different circle but uh Yeah, I was a fucking wild animal. It was horrible. So I knew I had to quit. And then it was just like a thing of like, you know, I was broke and I felt like my career was shit. And then I watched that Hicks documentary. And I was like, oh, maybe I could be like that. Maybe if I quit, I would have, not that I would do like Hicks style or whatever, but like I would be like, maybe I could be exponentially better and more successful. Yeah. So that definitely uh, helped. And I was with Gullman actually in Philly at uh, Helium. And like... I was like, I'm going to quit drinking. And then I ended up still drinking the first two nights. And then he gave me one of those like online, are you an alcoholic tests? Yeah. And it was like 28 questions and I hit like 26 of them. Wow. Which is like also like, you know, it's like a joke in like sobriety circles of like, also if someone's giving you that test, you're probably an alcoholic. Yeah, of course. It's Most like people the are just depression one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. First like, sign of depression is you're looking it up on yeah. YouTube. So it's like, you know, um, I knew I was a, a fucking mess. So then... Yeah, I quit, and like most of my career success has come in sobriety. I got like Letterman a year later. I I got passed at the cellar a month later, and um, all that shit. So, how long you been at the cellar? Uh, Six years. Well, I got passed there uh, in '07 
when I first moved here, Nick DePaulo, I was opening for DePaulo at the time, and DePaulo recommended me, and Esty called like randomly. I wasn't even trying to get in. She just called me, and I was like shitting my pants. She's like, Nick DePaulo has never uh, uh, recommended anybody, so you must be really special. And I was like, oh my God, this is insane. So yeah. she's like, come audition. So I auditioned, did well. And then I got one spot, and I followed Sherrod, who just ripped it. And I was so nervous because, like, I was like, I had just moved here, and I was just like shaking, and I fucking did okay. And then Esty was like, "How did it go?" And I was like, "Not great." And she was like, "Oh." oh. And I talked to Colin Quinn after. He's like, "Never say that." He's like, "Just always tell her it went great." Yeah. And then uh, I think like, I just didn't get a spot. I put in for like a year after that. Whoa. I didn't get any spots, and I was like, "Oh, I guess I'm out." And I had to like go back. I'm one of the few guys that's auditioned twice. I had wow. to go back there, you know, five years later or whatever. And this time, like, Gallman was there, recommended me. And Schumer just happened to be sitting there and Soder. It's so, like all these people recommended me. And like, I had changed as a comic and a person. So, like, yeah. I've been in ever since. So, it's been six years now. That's a great story. Yeah. So, technically, I've been passed for 11 years, but worked Whoa. there for six years. Wow. Yeah. And your wife just got passed. We were there for the brunch. Yeah, yeah. Has, has she been doing spots? She's getting spots, too, which is nice. It's like, it, it just makes such a difference. We get to hang there, and it's, you know, the money's good. They just fucking up the money without anyone asking, which is nice. I mean, I just, Gnome's the best. I love that place, man. I listened to that episode of your show, by the way. Oh, uh, with, with no, yeah. Oh, I was, love that guy. He was great, man. He's I love the best. that guy. He, he he reminds me a lot of myself because he's just he seems like he's always like, all right, this we're like that's how I always come off, and people are like, is this guy for real? Or what? But I'm like, dude, we're here. Yeah, yeah. Look, like we're like. We're not at a job. Yeah, yeah, we're mean? doing it. It's I it's pretty in amazing. That olive tree. I'm like, dude, we're here. Or the comedy store. I'm like, this is great, right? It's insane. I mean, it's like you have moments. I was just talking to my therapist about this of like trying to connect to like reality and like where you're at in life. Where I'm like, I got a wife that I love. I got a nice apartment. Yeah. I'm like, I'm doing comedy. I started taking mandolin. I'm like playing the mandolin. I'm like, I've always wanted to be a musician. I'm like, I'm a bad musician, but I'm a musician. I'm fucking playing. I'm like, I'm I'm doing it. Yeah. And, we're, you know, we're alive. We're doing all right. That's how I feel. And sometimes I'm at the cellar. I just feel like I'm the only guy there. I'm over in the corner. Like, I guess I guess nobody's... Oh, here's Joe Mackey. He'll be happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's insane. Like, but you know you know how life it is. You get adjusted to something. You kind of just forget. But you're yeah. like, you have to have those moments to be like, hey, this is pretty fucking badass. You went to that Pearl Jam run in uh, Boston, right? Yeah, I went to... I've been to 41 Pearl Jam shows now. Oh, shit, that's great. Yeah, and this year I went to the two shows in Seattle and two shows at Fenway. I wanted to go to the Seattle ones because Burr and I were up there like a few days before, and I was like, oh, God, I should stay and see that. It was killer, man. It was great. I mean, like, I've seen them so many times, and they're like one of those... They're obviously a great band, but like... They do a thing where, like, it's a live show. They play two hours, two and a half hours. It's kind of Springsteen-ish where, like, they'll just go. They change the set list every night. And they know that, like, they have that kind of Grateful Dead style thing where people are coming to multiple shows. So, like, they'll do... Nowadays, they're definitely... They're settling into, like, the classic rock. They're, like... There's a few tracks that, like, they'll do every show almost. So you'll get, like, eight repeats now where they used to do, like, completely different, but... It's pretty amazing. They they do a good job of being like, here's some hits, here's some rarities, bunch of covers, and they fucking they bring it. You know, they don't mail it in. So remember that run they did in Chicago where they played every song ever. Yeah, they did. Uh, they did that in Boston also. They did like a three show thing where they're like, we're gonna play every song we fucking know. Yeah, and then in the middle they broke into the Temple of the Dog run. You yeah, know? yeah, I've seen. I saw the Temple of the Dog. Back in the day at the Rip Party, and then I went to the Temple of the Dog tour a couple years ago before Cornell passed. Yeah, and uh, that's some of the finest music ever made, dude. There, it's amazing. All that, all that '90s uh, Seattle stuff. It's crazy that three of the four lead singers of the Big Four are Gone. fucking dead. I mean, it's insane. That's how real they were. It's it's crazy. So I mean, that that sucks. But I feel like so talk about like gratitude and feeling blessed, like. I've been a Pearl Jam guy since I was whatever twelve, and like they were always my favorite band. So like I feel so lucky that I got into the band that stayed together. Yeah, because there was people that like that was Soundgarden or Alice in Chains or Nirvana, obviously, and like they're all gone. Like Pearl Jam's still going strong, and like they're fucking, they're the best. I love them. Yeah, they are, man. I I I love Pearl Jam. I I booked them when they were Mookie Blaylock or something. Really? Fun. Yeah, I had. Uh, uh, Cantrell on the podcast from Alice in Chains, and I booked uh, Alice in Chains and Mookie Blaylock together one night. We, we tell the story on the episode. I I won't tell it again here, but listen to that episode with I will. Cantrell. It's 
it's pretty great but uh to be around that I, I grew up in that seattle uh era uh, you know in the bay area it was just non-stop you know everything from mother love bone all the way out yeah you know one of the things I love about Pearl Jam too is like they they blew up. They never wanted to be kind of that thing. They were trying to be like this kind of like club band, build their way up. Obviously, they exploded, but they they kind of like pulled back hardcore. Like after like Vitology, they stopped doing interviews and music videos. I love all that. So like they tour now and they sell out and they do stadium shows. But like if you talk to like the average person, like oh I remember them. You still know them? They yeah. still out there? Like they think they're like some bullshit That's band. All the bands I love, like Wallflowers. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they made like ten records. They're like they're still out there. Or the Black Crows was a classic on that record after record after the record. And people are like, I love Hard to Handle. You're right, like, right. What? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's. That's a good way to weed out the fake fans. Though. No, and it's nice that like they have these like diehards now, and like the average you get rid of all these kind of phony poser people so i think versus is a masterpiece oh yeah dude those, those like first five records to me are like unbelievable and i love all the, the newer stuff too oh yeah not not as much but um versus dude oh and and to me mad season yeah is the greatest record to come out of that fucking thing man mad season yeah yeah you know because you're gonna get a little pearl jam flavor there you're gonna get a little allison chains and then you're gonna get you know, Mark coming in with his crazy vocals also. You right, know? right. Uh, that, that shit's amazing. So everything out of there was just so organic and rad. Yeah, no, it was fun. And that same weekend that they played those the home shows, they called them at Safeco Field, they also had um, uh, Sub Pop did a festival down in Alki Beach, which oh, was wow. really cool. And so I went down there. But I was with like my niece and nephew who are like six and two. So we had to leave at like, you know, four o'clock before a lot of the bands came out. But that was cool too. I just I just love Seattle. I love that rock scene and Yeah, it's um, got a it's got a, a mystique and it still has something. When I land in, in Seattle, I still immediately pop off and I just think foggy day, heroin and grunge. Music. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fucking great. I think that right away. I love that. I, I mean, I love the whole story of like Eddie Vedder arriving from San Diego and he's like, I don't want to hang. I don't want to tour. I just want to go and start recording and playing. Yeah. And, and that's what they did. And then obviously he moved there and like still lives there fucking almost 30 years later. That documentary is great. It's great. I love it. Cameron Crowe cr killed it with that thing. Man. Yeah. It's so fun. And the only the one thing that bothers me about that documentary is the end. They're like talking to these fans. And there's a guy, he's like from the UK and he's like, they took on Ticketmaster and they won. And you're like, no, no, they lost yeah. horrifically. They lost that big time. Yeah. yeah. Like I just went to four shows this summer. Yeah. All through Ticketmaster, all huge fees. Like the tickets, are like two hundred bucks. I'm like, yeah. they didn't win. I don't know why that's included in the documentary. They didn't win. And matter of fact, that was the worst move for them because no one else. It was like when Metallica battled Napster. Yeah, yeah. No one backed him on it, and no one said they were right because they're like, uh, I got uh, mortgages and kids to feed here. Totally. You know, that's a that's a that's a crazy part of the of the movie. And that tour was a mess. It was too. a mess. That '96 it was tour. Canceling. Yeah, yeah. It was like brutal oh, so all that shit they, they get to the venues there was no insurance yeah yeah so it was like now nah, they kind of got their asses handed to them but i you know respect for trying obviously let's get into a little bit of our uh we'll, we'll get we'll just cast off some great stuff for um for uh 2018 i thought it was a great year there was some good stuff that happened for me yeah you, you ever sit around and you go like uh yeah you know uh I, nothing's going on and then you write it down and you go oh there's some things going on yeah like, totally so for you of course you did the um you did the uh 30 minute right yeah i did the netflix and i did the tonight show to promote it and uh so that That's was fun. awesome so i had both of those and then i was on the road just hard I, I looked at my calendar i was like holy shit i was out there a lot so what was the uh highlights of your uh 18 as far as comedy I think definitely, uh, yeah, Tonight Show was, like, amazing, having the Netflix thing out there. And then just, like, a lot of road dates, and, like, a lot of these places let me bring my wife, Sarah Talamon, she's a comic, so it's, like, the fucking dream. I'm on the road with my yeah. wife and uh, some fans coming out, the podcast, and I don't know. Those two things, definitely, Netflix and Tonight Show were amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. So I, I got to do Conan this year. Yeah, Which was, set, like, a dream. I went to Montreal. Yeah. That's the best. I did the LA Forum with Burr. 
That's amazing. Yeah, I got to do it with Louis. That room's insane. It like plays small, which is weird. Like it Isn't feels like weird? a club. It's like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like Burr's like, you just went up there like it was a club. I was like, it, it just kind of felt like that. That's what it feels like. Like Louis said that to me. He's like, well, you really brought your small ball comedy to a really big <laughs> fucking venue. Small ball comedy. It is though, because it's like kind of one level. There's not really an upper deck there. And it, yeah, it's yeah. like it's strangely it just, just plays great. like a real yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, man. He said that we did, like, that was the year before, 2016, I you toured, did that whole around? arena tour, and he was like, dude, he's like, this is the best, because that was the first date I did, he's like, don't get spoiled by the, this is the best room we're going to do, wow. was the forum, as far as arenas go. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I got a list of some records I posted, which is uh, hilarious, I posted them on Instagram, and I said that um, if you ever want to know what everybody's... Uh, list is just post yours and they'll ignore yours and post theirs yeah, in yeah. their comments no which totally is hilarious but uh some of my records of the year this is what i got i got okay i i gave honorable mentions to um the underground thieves which is a band i found out about two weeks ago that wow i'm pretty excited to have on the podcast pretty soon but this band they're they're doing something that i thought's very cool a single a month Huh. So by the end of the year, you got their record. Oh, interesting. People have such ADD. Of course, yeah, yeah. So they drop six of them, but I don't even find out about the band till the sixth one, uh, which was a song called Fall that sounded so like rad, psychedelic, Pink Floyd, heroin music. I was immediately in. Interesting. Okay, I got to check these out. See, yeah. you know a lot more of the music, obviously, than I do. So. Yeah, I'm just giving you that. And then All, All Them Witches was also an honorable mention. But here's my top 10 records. Number 10 was Charles Bradley, who passed away. Uh, what a bummer, man. Uh, the record's Black Velvet, and this guy's... Uh, if you don't know about Charles Bradley... Dive down the rabbit hole now, man. The guy was a a uh, James Brown impressionist. You know, like he did James Brown shows for years, and then a guy said, "Hey, man, we ought to do a record with your voice and uh, and, and your own music." Wow! And then he kind of blows up, plays like Coachella. You know, I see him, and then he uh, he passes away. Oh, what, yeah. was it like an overdose or no? It was a cancer. I can't remember now. I think it was a cancer. And uh, so they put a record out uh, that he had just finished before he died that Ugh. is unbelievable called Black Velvet. All right, I got to check that out. I love the Jeff Tweedy new solo record, Warm. Uh, Mother Hips, one of my favorite bands of all time, of all time, put out a great record this year that's number eight called Chorus. Tempest Movement, which I think is the best band out of Europe right now, who has, uh, I think, four records out. I had the uh, singer on the podcast, one of the great, great singers in the view into the Black Crows. Check out their new record, The Deeper Cut. Cypress Hill, Elephants on Acid. What a record, man. This deep into their career, they put out a crazy hip-hop record. Wow, okay. That thing is a smoker. Uncle Acid and the Dead Beats, just a masterpiece, Wasteland. Coulter Wall, which you listened to. Yeah, I just checked that out yesterday. I was going down your list. And, really? Because Marcus King, I think, was your... Was that your number one? Yeah, that's my number one. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to reveal your no, number no, one. No, <laughs> no, all good. Uh, and then Arctic Monkeys, man. I was never a big Arctic Monkeys uh, guy for years. They put this record out. It's got a heavy Bowie flavor, and I was like, this band is great, and now I'm loving all their shit. Sleep put out a masterpiece. They hadn't put out a record in 100 years. They drop a record out of nowhere. I was in Nashville when it happened on Record Store Day. I was at Third Man. I bought it on vinyl there, and it's one of the greatest records ever to come out. Man. Dude, I got I to gotta check these Sleep, out. Sleep, unbelievable. And then Marcus King, who is just uh, 24 years, 25 years old now, and uh, the greatest live show I've seen in a long time. Yeah, I want to go see. I was down in Asbury Park. I went to the See Here Now Festival, which was really cool. And uh, we walked into Stone Pony, just kind of strolled around, and they were coming there. Oh. I think I texted you. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'd like to go oh, check this right. show out. But because, yeah, I checked when you posted about them, I started checking them out. They were great. And that Coulter Wall, is that Coulter how you say Wall. his name? Yeah, I started listening to him yesterday and then went back to his first album. And that was great. Um, and they're all done by. Uh, not all of them, but a lot of these bands that I love now, Rival Sons, and, and they're all done by this one producer, in Nashville, who's basically the new Rick Rubin of the music industry. Wow. This guy is absolute. I think it's Dave Beck. Uh, so I forget his name. Let me find it. But this guy is absolutely. 
I mean, you know, he does uh, Sturgill, everyone. Right, right. Rival Sons, Marcus King, you know, and you're just going like, this shit is insane. This guy's so good, you know. Uh, let me get his name. Why? Okay, what do you got for your list of records? Well, I didn't make a ton of them, but that's all right. Because I don't, I'm, I'm not up to the new music. That's but all right, though. You know me. I comment on your Instagram. I'm a huge Brandy Carlisle fan. I yeah. love Brandy Carlisle. She put out an album this year called, I think it's called, by the way, I forgive you. And I fucking love. I'm like obsessed with her. And I thought that album was like amazing. She I got nominated for a ton of Grammys right and shit. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, she's got some killer stuff. She's kind of country, a little bit rock and roll. And uh, I'm a big fan. I'm going to see her on her birthday out at the Gorge in uh, in oh, Washington. Beautiful which is like, venue. I've been there when there wasn't a show going on, and it was like it looked amazing. So I'm going, looking forward to seeing her. I saw her down at that See Here and Now festival where right. I saw uh, Social D play with. Special guest Bruce Springsteen. Oh, that's insane! You which saw was that. fucking awesome. Yeah. Oh. Which I didn't even realize they were buddies. Um, but yeah, that was super cool. That was like a highlight for me. But I gotta get better with the new music scene. I discovered um, what was the other band I brought up to you yesterday? Uh, White Reaper. I didn't oh realize that album came out the year before. That shit's great. Their first album I actually liked better than the second one, but I like both a lot. Um, got really into that, and then I listened to a lot of that Marcus King band. Um, yeah, how did you like the Marcus King band? I like it. I dig it. I'm into it. They kind of remind me of Dr. Dog a little bit. Kind of right. like that kind of like psychedelic rock a little bit. Um, I'm trying to get into the... I'm trying to get the guy's name here that produced it because this guy, Dave Cobb. Dave Cobb, okay. This guy is unbelievable who he's produced, you know? And he's just... Let me, let me get his Wikipedia right here because that's like the thing we're talking about early on. <laughs> You love a band, then you love another band, and all of a sudden you look and you go, wait a minute, this one guy's producing all these records. That's how Rick Rubin was to me, you right. know, uh, who's just a, an insane. So look at this, Sturgill Simpson, Chris Stapleton, both two of the biggest Nashville Kings and great records. You get into that Chris Stapleton? I have not listened to much of his oh, stuff. Oh, you got to hear that. Jamie that Johnson, who's one of my favorite country guys. of Ella. These aren't those Nashville guys like, I've got a whiskey and yeah, a yeah. truck. That's no. how, like, I, I've got into Margot Price. I'm going to see her on New Year's Eve. And yeah. I, she's kind of similar where it's like, oh, this feels like her first record I like better than the second one. But it kind of feels like it's like rock and roll and country. And you're like, oh, this is like real country. Yeah. Like yeah. that kind of rock country. Same These thing. guys are all like Bill Hicks. But country music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, Holy shit. Oh, I forgot. He did Shooter Jennings' new record this year, which I didn't even make on my list. I forgot. It is insane, Shooter Jennings' record. I got to check all these out. Yeah, See, this and is then good. Uh, Brandy Carlisle. He did Brandy Carlisle. Oh, dude. wow. There you go. That's fucking See? nuts. This, See? Guy, this guy's killing it. This, it's unbelievable. Anderson East, one of the great, great singers. So there, uh, and Jason Isabel. Yeah. So, I mean, God, so That's look at that. Quite a year. Yeah. I mean, it's a good time for music. And it's like you said, like, people, it just, we're, we feel so like overwhelmed with like Justin Bieber or whoever the fuck it is or uh, Brandy, what the hell's her name? All them. Yeah. Brandy B or whatever. Yeah. I can't, I always say. Cardi B. Uh, Cardi B. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, keep, I, I, keep, I keep seeing those. I have like dyslexia because I'm like really into Brandy Carlisle. So I'll yeah. see Cardi B and there's like a few of the same letters. I'm like, oh, oh, oh this yeah. is like whatever this dog shit is. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and then have you ever heard this guy? Is it Brent Cobb? Is that somebody? Some guy sent me. There's a guy that's like a fan of my podcast. He works at a record record company, and he sent me a bunch of records. So I just started pulling them out like one at a time and listening to him. A couple of them I wasn't into. There's a guy. I think his name is Brent Cobb, yeah. who is kind of like a country type singer, like a folk country. And I was really digging it. I got to find the guy's name. I love that kind of stuff. I, I love rock, but then I'll go way deep into like some good, like Sturgill or Chris Stapleton or that Jamie Johnson. He had a record out called, uh, uh, what was it? High, Pro High Cost of Living. It, it, this record is insane about, I don't know, nine years ago. I'm going to go check out some of these because that's the other thing with some of this country or like singer songwriter stuff. A lot of times you're on the subway or you're just hanging at the house. And it's like, I don't feel like rocking. I just yeah. want to sit on my couch and kind of fucking hang out. Or I'm on the, the subway. You can't really be like drumming along. So that's where like this stuff is good, that yeah. kind of singer songwriting stuff. And also, it, it, I think it operates a different part of writing in your mind. Too. Yeah, yeah. That's if you start doing the same and... shit all the time, you're not going to write different stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's like Burr always says, you know, every city he goes to, he tries to go, hey, I'm going to try skeet shooting. And then the next one, he's like, I'm going lobster catching. You know, yeah. To try to get some kind of story. Get some know? experience, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What do you got for movies? Movies, it's like, it's. we talked about it before we started, I guess, like, yeah, movies, they don't come out all at once, so it's like here and there, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, actually, it was a pretty decent year for movies. Yeah, But there, there wasn't, wasn't a lot of great stuff, but uh, Leave No Trace, I talked about it a while ago. Uh, I love that movie with uh, Ben Foster, who's kind of—it's like, kind of like a great movie about um, you know fucking like PTSD and like mental mental health. This guy's like a uh, Iraq veteran. I think he's Iraq or Afghanistan. I think it's Iraq, but he's like trying to live in the woods off the grid. But he's got a daughter, and you know hijinks ensues. It's it's depressing. Yeah, but it's a really you great movie. Great. Yeah, I really love that movie. That movie like stuck with me. Um, What's it called again? It's called Leave No Trace. Leave No Trace, man. I got to see that. Right when you told me, I tried to see it, and it was gone out of the theaters. I think it's you can get it on iTunes now. And then uh, the Coen Brothers movie I loved. Oh, yeah. The, uh, what the hell is it called? Ballad of Buster Scruggs? The one on Netflix? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the beignets. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I'm a huge Coen Brothers fan. I like everything they do. But so I that one it. I really enjoyed. I fucking loved it. I thought it was hilarious. Um, and then we were talking about this movie, Blaze. Yeah. About a real life singer songwriter who uh, passed away. And that yeah. movie was really Ethan Hawke directed. Big year for Ethan Hawke. He directed that. And then he's in another one of my favorite movies, for, uh, First Reformed, which was directed by Paul Schrader, which was super dark and fucking weird and cool. I didn't see that either. That one's great. Um, and then Thoroughbreds came out early. That was like a yeah. little Hitchcocky. And you saw that, right? Yep. I really dug that. And then Mid 90s, I liked a lot. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was like male ladybird to me. Yeah. And then the favorite I just saw, which I enjoyed also. With Did you Emma like that? Stone. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was fun. Yeah, somebody told me that it was, they hated it. but Oh, really? Did you see Green Book? No, I haven't seen I Green Book. I gotta see that. You know, I'm about to go to Vegas in two days, so I'm gonna see like nine movies. Oh, I yeah. Don't gamble, drink, or smoke. Well, there, yeah, so yeah. I'll go to the movies, you know. I hit those movies, yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are the ones I really liked. Vice, I haven't seen yet. I'm really looking forward to that. That comes out on Christmas. Oh, I'm dying to see I'm that. looking forward to that. How That'll great do those guys look? Unbelievable. And like um Christian Bale's like unbelievable, like Corral, he's like not even recognizable I can't even and stuff. Believe it's them. Yeah, yeah. So that looks that looks amazing. I like Adam McKay too, so uh, looking forward to those, but yeah, How thoroughbred about the Queen movie. Which one? Did Scotland? Bohemian Rhapsody. No, oh, I haven't seen. I think you meant the Queen of oh, yeah. Scotland or whatever the yeah, fuck. Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't seen the Queen movie. Right, that's a fucking smoker for me. I saw it twice. Uh, Mid nineties, I saw Black Klansman. Uh, it was okay. Yeah, we talked about that. There's yeah. some really ridiculous really stuff ridiculous in there. We were like, stuff. what? I'm such a Spike Lee fan, and I was just kind of like, I was really. Uh, was surprised at the turns that Spike Lee would do uh, on this film. And I'm not going to give it away, but that was just my thought. I love Spike Lee. I'll see anything he does. So I'm, I, I heard a lot of people, a lot of people are blowing this film up. Sorry to bother you. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that one. I know, and every it's making a lot of big lists. Yeah, I heard a couple of people say it sucked, and a lot of people say it was like brilliant. So you're like, boy, well, what's going on here? Right, right. Well, that seems to be every film lately, right? I got these are the times we're living in, I guess. Nobody seems to be on board on everything. Oh, uh, let's see this one. Isle of Dog, that came out so long ago. I saw that, yeah. I thought that was in 17, but that's... Uh, I thought that was mediocre. And I did I'm a too. Huge Wes Anderson. Same guy. here. Huge Wes Anderson movie. I, I uh, Wes Anderson movie. Wes Anderson fan. But that one I thought was a little bit lacking. Like it was just kind of. I found it a little like the story was just saw. It was like so like one dimensional. Yeah, I wasn't that into it. I didn't think it was overly funny or overly poignant, and yeah. it became a little bit like a kid's movie it felt like yeah. I, just, I didn't dig it and i was a little bummed because it took so long for him to make that i know something else ain't going to come out for a long time right right and his track record with me is stellar yeah oh, yeah what's your favorite from him like i i like that uh the submarine one oh and, yeah and the uh, life, aquatic. life aquatic yeah and i and a lot of people are like, blow that one off i love that and i love that camping one uh, oh moonrise kingdom oh yeah. man the first three are my favorite of to course. me i think it goes yeah rushmore bottle tenenbaum's bottle rocket, bottle rocket. those are my first but rushmore's number rushmore i think is like a fucking masterpiece that's Tenenbaum's. like one of the best movies ever fucking smoker i love it yeah those three are definitely the best and then owen wilson kind of stopped 
writing with them. So yeah. I thought all the movies without Owen are not as great and not like as poignant. They're not as like sweet to the me. The last couple weren't that good. The hotel one. Yeah, that was kind of fine. And then uh, Darlene's, uh, the, the train one. Yeah, yeah, that one. That's the least best one, I thought. Yeah. The so, soundtrack's killer, though. But Moonrise Kingdom came out in the middle of those, so I was like, oh, he's still got it. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Darjeeling yeah. Limited, best soundtrack, worst Wes Anderson movie. That's got the kinks on there. and Oh, um, yeah. I still um, need to see um, Eighth Grade. I didn't see haven't that. haven't seen that one either. And, uh, and then, of course, I was talking about some other films that I saw. Won't You Be My Neighbor? I dug that. Oh, yeah, that I was good. saw that good. twice. That was touching. That was good, the uh, Mr. Rogers one. Yeah. And uh, let's see what else. I guess that's about it for the films. I saw a lot of films this year. And there were some good ones. I like going to the movie theater. Oh, The House the Jack Bill. Yeah, that was the one I was telling you. Matt yeah, Dillon. Wow. I, yesterday I had time to kill and I thought about going to see it, but it's got like, even in the trailers, like a torture scene. It's pretty like, brutal. And that movie sat with me for about a week and it was like a cold week. It snowed the night I saw it. Yeah. Uh, I went to the premiere and, and Matt Dillon was there. And I went to the uncut version. Oh, wow. Which is supposed to be even gnarlier. <laughs> and I was like, you know, people walked out on it at yeah. that con. So I was there and I was like, whoa, this is fucking crazy. But Matt Dillon is, he is, a, he is a god, man. Yeah. This guy's acting every time crushes it. Wait, what's his, he has a brother, right? Yeah, yeah. He, what's Kevin, his brother? Kevin Dillon. Kevin Dillon. Who was in Entourage. Okay, which one's in Platoon? Is that Matt Dillon or Kevin Dillon? Uh, that's Kevin Dillon. Okay, I get him confused. Matt Dillon did Outsiders. Right, right. He did Drugstore Cowboy. He did Crash. Right. He did Tex. He did uh, uh, Over the Edge. Something about Mary, is that Something him? Something about Mary. Yeah. This guy's track record is so unbelievable. Yeah. And he... He is Hollywood mystique, like Sean Penn. Never, never doing interviews. Never see him out in the public. It's just only movies, and right. then he disappears on his Instagram and puts up like art and paintings and photos of him in like France and shit. This uh, guy's films are unbelievable. I might check that movie out. It's tough. Like I don't mind blood and gore and violence. Yeah. Obviously, like Goodfellas and The Godfather, are my favorite movie, my oh, three yeah. favorite movies ever. But those like torture is- scenes where like someone's like on their knees with shit in their mouth and I'm like oh fuck man well, like this a rape one is thing. so twisted yeah that you're almost laughing a little bit like come on man you right know what right because I mean? you gotta laugh a little bit to make yourself feel okay of I'm course like, yeah holy shit yeah uh, and then uh, Ottawa, we're not talking we talked a little bit concerts I went and saw I saw the Springsteen on Broadway oh, back in uh, April and that was like that's oh. the best show I've ever seen of any kind and now that soundtrack is out it's out on netflix so if you want to call that an album or whatever that's like unbelievable but seeing it live was like the top best five thing I've ever show seen. ever for me ever. yeah same I here actually cried. i cried like a bunch i got a father thing going on and yeah. like springsteen's like my number one so that was like incredible i feel like talk about gratitude for like seeing shit and living shit that How was great amazing was that? and the theater's like so intimate so and so small it was like insane i couldn't and, believe uh, when they opened the door and you're like oh here's my seat right here dude crazy because like, we were in the back of the house but you're still like 12 rows back Fucking dude. nothing man amazing i got the poster and uh so that was amazing that's on netflix now yeah yeah God. and my agent got me the ticket for like a congrats on netflix gift oh. and i was like because they were like if you want to get tickets to anything we want to celebrate and i was like well listen i know this is a tough ask but that would be my number one fucking thing to do and then they made it happen. So if, it, if, it, if they never got me another gig, I would blow my agent until I it's died. It's so moving, right? To, I think about, you know, that is something I will never forget. Yeah, it was incredible. And like he read from the book and like I, I feel like so connected to that guy and like the stories of the songs, the songs themselves, incredible. I mean, like what a brilliant artist. And the way it opens where he's like, I've been a fraud. I've sung about factories and yeah, working yeah, on yeah, cars yeah. and racing, and I've done none of it. Yeah. That's how good I am. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Wow. It's man. amazing. 
It's well, amazing. I lay it out there of like I've been a fraud. Yeah, yeah. And it's all on uh, iTunes yeah, now. I've been listening to it, it Travis. Yeah. So, yeah, I check that it. out if you haven't. Well, thanks for doing the pod, dude. Thanks so much, man. I love it. I appreciate it. And I'm a fan. Congrats on uh, a great year, the Netflix 30 Minute and the Tonight Show. Yeah, go check those out. And uh, you got some road dates coming up. This comes out next week on the uh, 1st. Uh, yeah, I got uh, this month, January. I'm doing Zanies in Chicago, the uh, Old Town Room, and then Comedy on State, which is like my favorite club in the fucking country, oh, in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, Comedian Joe List, you can see my dates and stuff. But yeah. And your podcast with and the Mark podcast, Norman. Tuesdays with Stories, yeah. It's Mark Norman and I being fucking weird and irreverent and shitty and saying horrible things. It's yeah. really fun. But it's a comedy. It's pure comedy. I mean, we're goofing around. Uh, for an hour so uh, check that out and the Netflix is still up there season two of the stand-ups it's a half hour go see it and then the act I'm doing on the road now is completely different so check out both yeah you got all new stuff from then yeah pretty much yeah because like I mean I had like 50 at the time so I started off with 20 yeah that's the nice thing about only doing a half hour because <laughs> you get that extra right? 20 minutes 25 minutes so I've built it since then so hopefully we'll do something this year too are you a fast rider or is it slow it depends. Like when I'm in it and I'm like feeling it, I turn it off. Yeah. I like to fucking be a husband and like go see music and movies. But when I have it kind of turned on, I can kind of yeah. I can create. And I've gotten a higher batting average. That's the nice thing about doing comedy. The longer you're in it, like when you're first starting, when I was first few years, you're just like doing thirty percent of what yeah. I write like ends up in the act. But now I can get it up to like seventy. You know. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's not that often that you spend time writing something and then it ends up being shit. Yeah. Most of it, you're like, I can figure this out and get it in there. Yeah, Burrow, or no, Marin told me, he said, uh, if you're doing something and you think it's funny and it's not working, you're just not doing it right. Yeah, now. yeah. You know, that's just all there is to it. That's the thing with like listening to sets. You can kind of figure it out yeah. now. But early on, you'd be like, all right, I guess that sucks. Never mind. How about this? No, that sucks. Never mind. Yeah. So. Well, I love you, man. Thank thanks, you man. so Appreciate much for it. doing it. It's great to be... Uh, the last seven months or whatever, working with you all the time. I love, I love hanging with you and Joe Mackey and 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 everybody at the cellar. Yeah, we got a good crew over there, man. Yeah, it's a good time. It's just some fun times, man. For sure. And uh, go see Joe. And uh, let's see. I will be at. Uh, where am I going to be? I will be. Oh, I'll be at the March seven eight nine Irvine. Uh, Irving. Uh, no, Houston. Improv. I don't even know what the fuck I'm trying to say <laughs> here. Off, man. I know. Well, whenever I think improv, I think Irvine. Right, right, improv, right. You know? yeah, that makes sense. I'll be at the Houston Improv, uh, March 7, 8, and 9, and Detroit Comedy Castle in April. Those are the dates up right now. And uh, Los Angeles all of January. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Have a great 2019, everybody. Keep the candles lit. <laughs>